a giant flock of birds of prey. The aerial acrobats are kites. Leaving no carcass behind, they've been given the name Vultures of the North. True lightweights amongst the feathered hunters are harriers. They playfully create a bond for the next breeding season. The backdrop for their performance has changed drastically over the past few years. But the adaptability of kites and harriers is the reason why these delicate artists are back on the ascent. It's early March. Many animals are still searching the ground for a safe place from the cold. The ones who can't escape from their enemies into the air have a problem. There's no cover for their hairs. Only a state of high alert can ensure their survival. Or a good hiding place. Warm and protected, the hamster is asleep in its hollow at the edge of the field. It collected a supply of food in the late summer when there was still plenty to eat and it feeds from it during the short waking periods in the winter. The ones who can't do that either camouflage themselves or flee. The jackdaws simply flee to the next field. But biologist Claudia Purkauer from the Bavarian Society for the Protection of Birds is looking for the animals that make considerably longer journeys. She recognizes the common buzzard immediately with its wide wingspan like a small eagle. It stays put even in the winter. The buzzard does manage to defend itself against the jackdaws, but it's not very agile. The common buzzard is mostly found in Germany's fields. It is looking for prey, predominantly mice, usually from a raised hide. Unplowed areas provide a refuge not only for this pair of wind chats, but also for their predator. The marsh harrier flutters its wings in the wind, spread out in a V shape. It always looks for prey from the air. The male marsh harrier is a striking figure its wings span over 1 meter 20, but are not as wide as the buzzards. Its tail is long and slightly rounded at the back. The underside of its tail and wings is typically pale, only the ends are black. And it wears red trousers. The female is a little bigger and is predominantly brown. Far more nimble than the buzzard of the same size, the harrier is able to make a capture even in high reeds sometimes. This one has only been here a few days. The marsh harrier spends the winter in Spain or Africa. Harrier specialist Claudia is happy to see this sight. Nevertheless, she is concerned. Where is its sibling? Senegal, Africa, almost 5,000 kilometers away. You wouldn't expect the birds that dominate the landscape here to be birds of prey. And yet the vultures that feed on carcasses also belong to the same species as hawks. 
The delicate Montagu's harrier is also a member of this large bird family. They are here on a summer retreat, when it gets too cold far away in Europe and there isn't enough to eat. A few powerful flaps of their wings to take off, then they glide there, light as carrier pigeons. It's almost time to start the long journey to Europe. At the end of March, there is finally some movement in the fields there. And a special kind of bird of prey arrives immediate. The red kite is one of the first of the migrating birds to make it back home. It glides quietly across the ground without much flapping of its wings. Kites hunt by sight, just like harriers. They know how to spot a good opportunity better than almost any other bird of prey. The plough has brought small animals up to the surface. We only find the red kite in Europe. It needs a wide open landscape for hunting, so fields have become one of its favourite areas. This is the easiest place for this keen-eyed huntsman to find its prey. The red kite gets its name from the brown and red colour of the feathers on its body and wings. The white area at the tips of its wings is striking, alongside its light-coloured head and clearly indented tail. The fields change rapidly around April, May. The very thing that brings us pleasure is a big problem for the red kites. There is no prey to catch in the rapeseed that has grown so high so early. It needs open fields to hunt in and trees for nesting. This little thief has no reason to fear the predator. The red kite is too big and not agile enough to catch it between the trees. The red kite likes to cushion its nest with old newspapers and other pieces of rubbish. Partners from the year before often find their way back together at their nests. During the breeding period, the male provides for the female, with rubbish, mice, and until recently, mainly with an animal that has become rare in the open countryside. He only dares to come out after dark, provided it is already the end of April and therefore time for the field hamster to emerge. The hamster hasn't left its hollow for almost half a year now. Nowadays, it is no longer a given that it will survive the winter. Many hamsters die of hunger. They don't always find enough seeds in the autumn because the grains are being harvested increasingly early and only dry foods like that will keep over the winter. In order to avoid hunters like red kites that are active during the day, the hamsters put off much of their activity until the night time. But hungry foes roam around at night too. So the hamster always needs a cover, even in the dark.
The days are getting longer and warmer now. The winter barley, the only grain, has now reached knee height. It is time for Claudia Perkauer to keep a lookout for her young charges. Pellets, undigested regurgitated food and feathers. Owls are not the only ones to leave this behind. There it is, the one who left this residue. Grey, the size of a pigeon, wings with black tips and a black stripe on the top. A little male Montagu's harrier. Finally, they have returned from Africa. The female is brown with a striking white face mask, and just like all harriers, it has a notably long tail. The males are already marking their mating territory. The males go after their chosen ones. With all they've got. A mouse is the bridal gift. For the female it proves as a couple they will have mice as food for the offspring. And he is clever enough to catch them. The large number of harriers indicate a good year for mice. Courtship and laying eggs don't happen when the harriers don't find any mice. The couple woo each other in a spectacular dance in the sky. The Montagu's harriers don't breed side by side in colonies but they do tolerate each other within a reasonable distance on the same field. The female looks convinced and lures the male. Even though there are many others to choose from, the pairs in mating season appear to be strictly monogamous. The male stands guard. Another kind of hunter is close by. The fox wouldn't have offspring either if there weren't enough mice. But the winter was mild, and so there is enough for everyone. Foxes don't regurgitate food for their offspring like wolves do, but instead they bring it to them, whole. The vixen has the best chance that her young will survive when there are plenty of mice available. The cubs are now too big for the red kites. They like to settle close to lakes and rivers. They're also good at catching fish. The female red kite brings a tissue to cushion the nest. Sometimes shreds of plastic too. Plastic is dangerous for the young as the water can't flow out of the nest when it rains and the chicks can become ill. 
While the female is on the lookout, the male has made a good catch. Carrion and pieces of rubbish are important sources of nourishment for red kites nowadays. Yet the buzzard doesn't like the idea of sharing at mealtime. Bigger but lighter, the red kite loses out. He can't return to the nest without any food. He takes some food that he put away earlier and feeds it to the female, so that at least he looks like the breadwinner of the family. There are now baby animals all over the forest. The fawn hides in a safe place while its mother is grazing. The two only come together from time to time for the fawn to suckle. The fawn is safe from the red kite. It is looking for fish instead. A fish is just the right size. The red kite needs space to hunt down its prey and grab it. Lakes and fields are both wide open landscapes. The red kite tries its luck elsewhere when it can't catch hamsters and mice due to modern field cultivation methods. Nowadays, fields are mostly giant single crop industrial areas. They hardly offer any protection and what's more, they're often covered in poison. Spaces like this no longer provide homes for field hamsters. So they have become an extremely rare sight, especially in the daytime. They only dare to come into the daylight in a few small patches of meadow. One thing entices him from his hollow. The male hamster is ready to mate. But first he must win the female's trust. Hamsters are loners and aren't used to closeness. She tolerates him by her side just for a short while. The two go their separate ways again after they've mated. The green fields now offer the suckling doe some good fresh nourishment. The winter barley is the only grain that is already tall enough but isn't ready to be cut down yet, unlike in the neighbouring meadow. The Montagu's Harrier can find building materials here for its nest, but no longer a mating ground. In the past, birds mated in the wetlands and meadows, but marshes are being drained and the meadows are mown very early in the year. The Montagu's Harriers have cleverly worked out how to adapt to the changing landscape. They mate here in the winter barley. If that hadn't grown, these birds would have died out here. Lizards are just the right size that harriers like to eat. Adult hares are too big. Nevertheless, the male dares to attack, but only to drive the long-eared animals out of their nesting ground. One meadow after the other is now being mown.
everyone is here. Harriers, buzzards, red kites. There is a rich array on offer to them, just like after it was ploughed several weeks earlier. Mice are startled as their cover is revealed. The doe left her young in this field. Where is the fawn? The kites, vultures of the north, will find it. So that the same fate doesn't threaten the harriers and their brood in the fields of winter barley, nature conservationists have been working together with the resident farmers for several years. They inform them when the harriers are expected to be brooding in their farmlands. If the farmers agree not to mow the affected parts of their land, they are provided with other land as compensation. The winter barley is still green, so there is no danger. The harriers have only just laid their eggs. Mostly, there are three or four. The time has now come for Susan Janowski. For her doctoral thesis, the biologist is researching how much the animals stay close to home, who the fathers of the brood are, how many animals move there, and from where. So she places a kind of bugging device in the bird's nest, disguised as an egg. The egg has holes in it not only to provide ventilation. The biologist observes the breeding ground. She is waiting for the female to leave the nest and to seize her opportunity. She simply sneaks the bug egg under the harriers. The harrier returns to the nest after a short time. Without being noticed, the kissing bug pierces the skin of the brooding female and sucks itself full of blood. A bug egg like this is slipped into the nests of dozens of harriers for a short time. As soon as the female has left the nest again, Susan can collect the egg. The bug needs around 10 minutes to fill up. The bug egg is noticeably heavier. The kissing bug now really does have a firm abdomen filled with harrier blood. The blood now needs to be analysed. Suddenly, a foreign bird of prey dares to make its way into Montagu's harrier territory. It is the marsh harrier. Although the Montague's Harrier is clearly smaller than its relative, it doesn't tolerate the intruder here. 
The marsh harrier also likes to use the open field or freshly mown meadow to hunt. It still continues to mate in the marshlands though. The draining of these marshlands has resulted in a sharp decline in numbers of these harriers. In a way that is typical for harriers, the male woos the female by offering a bridal gift, a symbol of their connection that the birds repeat every now and then during the breeding season. The major relative of the Montagu's harrier has been one of the biggest victims of landscape change. Yet the ban on DDT insecticide and the introduction of protection zones have helped to raise the numbers of marsh harriers again. The male attentively patrols his territory. Nobody is to come too close to his family. The pair already have young in their nest in a small undisturbed corner around three weeks earlier than the Montague's harrier. Here too, it is mainly the father that provides for the young. But the adult birds come to the nest regularly, even without bringing any gifts to keep a watchful eye on the little ones. The windchats need to be careful. They have their own young to take care of. There is no sibling love palpable among the marsh harriers. As with many birds of prey, the term pecking order applies in its truest sense. Often, the youngest family member doesn't survive, even when the parents hunt for what they can. Adult hares are too heavy, even for marsh harriers. But separated from their mothers, young hares often crouch in tall grass. Even for marsh harriers, our largest harriers, a catch like this is not the order of the day. Now, the female hare has noticed the attack on her young, but it is too late. Early summer unfolds in all of its splendor. It will soon be time for the second mowing of the meadow. A source of nectar will be there for many insects. The grains will also soon be threshed. Claudia Purkauer is sought after again. For several years, she has chosen to use drones. The advantage of this method, she is able to look for harriers from a distance in an unmown field without creating a pathway to the nest for robbers like foxes. Will these little birds that hatched late survive? The farmer knows about the Montagu's harriers in his field. He will refrain from harvesting the grain with a 50 metre boundary around the nest. In return, he will receive another patch of land or a compensation. 
Yet there are dangers that compensation can't prevent. The fox is the young brood's most dangerous enemy. But it can smell something else right now. It is micing, as this jumping technique is called. Not only hamsters put food away for the winter, but because the fox doesn't have fat cheeks, it has to use another strategy. It hides its loot. And keeps hunting. If the fox isn't successful, it starts to look for food supplies little by little. It fills its mouth as full as it can and makes its way back home to the young. This method saves time and energy. When it's a good year for mice, life is twice as good for the harriers. Enough food for themselves and also for the fox, who doesn't need to come after their chicks. Claudia Perkauer's team doesn't want to rely on that alone. A helper places a fence that foxes can't get through around several of the nests previously discovered using the drones. Once people are out of reach, the parents feel safe to return to the nest. The harriers seem to be tolerating the protection measures. For purposes of comparison, not all of the nests are protected. It could be the case, after all, that giving too much protection to them has negative effects. For example, that the brood isn't as well nourished by the parents and that more birds survive without protection even if the fox clears out some nests. The red kite has made a rare catch in its territory, a small bird. They are able to do that now and again in the open field, but never in the woods. Its young are already almost independent after more than 40 days. Around 18,000 pairs of red kites are breeding here, which is more than half of the world's population. But a nest full of independent young is no longer something we can take for granted. The number of offspring is declining. Conservationists see the cause above all as the loss of variety. More and more grasslands and fallow fields are being turned into monocultures. What's more, due to the use of chemicals against weeds and rodents, the grain is growing so fast that the kite is simply losing its sense of perspective. Freshly mown meadows do offer advantages. Young foxes also benefit. The hamster, on the other hand, has a problem with it. How is it supposed to look for food without being seen? The young are just four days old, blind and deaf, and completely dependent on their mother. If anything happened to her, the whole litter would perish. Hamsters follow a strategy that is typical for young rodents. They can have many offspring every year, two litters, with up to 18 young each time. Not all of them survive the cold, the predators and lack of food, but from this large number, several are left. The little ones don't want to let go of their milk source, but if you're raising many offspring, you need to conserve your energy. The mother needs to find something to eat, whether or not they want her to. Look 
looking for food in the middle of the day is highly risky. And the female hamster is more careful than usual. Young foxes are still out practicing. It's too much for the mother. She goes without food. It wouldn't be the first time a fox has dug up a hamster family. She moves her home. Quite an ordeal with so many babies. But she has already prepared for it. Hamsters always have several pockets of food. The winter barley is ripe in July. Now, the young Montagu's harriers are big enough to tag. With the help of the GPS data stored earlier in the year, Claudia Purkauer finds the nests again quickly. This nest has only been marked with a flag, not a fence against the foxes. And yet all of the young have survived. And the farmer will continue to mow around the flag at the right distance. With the tagging ring, the bird becomes an individual. Wherever it is found, bird watchers know where it comes from and how old it is. The farmer is also helping. These chicks are even younger. Not all couples start to brood at the same time. Many hands are needed, and the cooperation motivates the farmers in addition to the compensation to make their land available. Over the past few years, the Montagu's harriers have seen a return to their breeding success. And recently, they have also been reproducing again in regions from which they had long since disappeared. Slowly but surely, the other grains are becoming ripe. Small animals can still find protection here, like crickets. When mating, the female is on top and leaves a mark on her sexual partners with her scent. And then she knows for sure he's been here before. The hamster mother has had a difficult time. Her offspring are still dependent on her, but they are becoming more and more independent by the day. The mother is able to limit her search for food to the safe nighttime hours again. Now she can find plenty to eat around their hollow. The youngsters want to go outside now too. A grasshopper is about to be eaten. Hamsters are not strict vegetarians. Even amongst hamsters, there are frightening, obedient and less obedient characters. The barn owl has caught a water vole this time. The very next day, the hamster's world will be completely changed 
and not all of them will survive this change. With the modern combine harvester, a field is laid bare in just a few hours, no chance to escape. But the farmers have spared them. The young Montagu's harriers have now become independent. The female is practicing how to catch prey with them, with the same game that she will later use to find a partner. Little by little, the harriers need to learn how to survive alone. They will travel to Africa as soon as mid-August. When the autumn casts its colours across the land, the delicate birds are already long gone. The strong autumn winds are good for producing energy. But for the kites, the wind turbines are fatal. The fallow land, rich in food, attracts the birds underneath the pylons as if by magic, often with deadly consequences. An estimated 300 red kites perish every year in wind turbines. Autumn is the season for flocks of birds. The red kites are some of the first to return in the spring and some of the last to leave. They roam around across large areas and use fields that have been harvested in the meantime to catch small birds and mice. They often gather in numbers where the temperature conditions are best. With this technique of using warm ascending winds, they sail through the largest part of their flight towards the south, 50 to 200 kilometers every day. The Iberian Peninsula is the goal for most of them. They arrive after around two weeks. Throngs of vultures of the north, red kites, gobble up every last scrap of roadkill. Rabbits, visibly smaller than hares, are a welcome addition to the kite's food supply. The little long-eared creatures seem to know that. For an animal that hunts by sight, the barren land with just a few trees is ideal. And there's another benefit. Baiting areas. Really, it's not meant for red kites, but for dwindling vulture species but that doesn't stop the kite from seizing the opportunity. Other guests from Central Europe have also come to spend the winter in this host country with its pleasant winter climate. Marsh Harriers. The game with the mouse also happens in Spain. Just like at home, the birds here like to withdraw to the reed areas. They share the terrain with local harriers who breed in Spain and stay the whole year round.
Not all of the migrating birds in Central and Western Europe set off on the journey south anymore. Around 2,000 red kites in Germany alone avoid the strenuous journey. So now the buzzard, who has never moved very far, has to share its territory with them. After the breeding period, the kites have set aside their territorial behaviour and often spend the night together. In winter, the fields are completely bare again. The hamster has already been in hibernation for a long time. Mice hardly dare to come out. In addition, snow makes the search for food more difficult. But the fox and hare have been fine with that for centuries. The kites, on the other hand, have a hard time. Since unregulated rubbish dumps have become rare, they only survive with the help of supplementary feeding in some places. And the point and value of offering such measures to help them are controversial. Seeing images like this, makes it hard to believe that the northern harrier that lives in the cold northern regions of Europe during the summer should choose Central Europe as their winter residence. They breed from Ireland to Kamchatka and very occasionally on the North Sea Islands. Now it is too uncomfortable for them in their breeding areas, too cold. It looks confusingly similar to the Montague's Harrier. But if you see a delicate grey bird skillfully hunting across the fields in the winter, you can be sure it is not a Montague's Harrier. Because they already moved from Europe to Africa in August. Across the wide savanna, the harriers hunt in their usual way, their wings in a V-shape letting them flutter. They have also been observed here for several years by the biologist Almut Schleich and her colleague Jan Cox. The vultures are here all year round. There is no need for them to go elsewhere. They find carcasses everywhere, above all in countries where cattle is kept openly. Water, on the other hand, is in short supply. The few watering holes attract many animals. So Almut and Jan look there first to find harriers. There they are. The distribution and behavior of the Montagu's Harriers have been documented for many years, also in their African resting places. Because what use is the best protection of the brood in Europe if the animals die in their winter homes? The jackals don't like seeing the harriers here at all. The vultures can defend themselves, but for the harriers, the jackal takes on the role of the fox in Africa as enemy number one. The birds that sleep on the ground are easy prey, especially at night. This time, the jackal just wants to cool off, but after the sun goes down, that will change. The researchers are interested in what the birds eat, among other things. 
Since mice are quite rare, Almut and Jan are looking for feces and pellets. They mostly find the remains of grasshoppers and other insects inside. Showing how adaptable these delicate artists are, the harriers in Senegal adjust their eating habits accordingly. They take whatever there is plenty of, and so these mice hunters turn into insect hunters. But that has its drawbacks. DDT insecticide is still used in many African countries to fight the plagues of insects. The scientists want to convince the people in the country to use other less harmful methods. Migrating birds like the Montagu's Harrier need protection across different countries, even across different continents. If that can be achieved, they can continue to present their acrobatic skills from Africa to Europe and beyond for many years to come. These fascinating birds that perform their circus in the sky.